Hello, my name is Olivia Mattis, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Sousa Mendes Foundation to today's program. We have a very big crowd with us today, and I'm so delighted. We have a moderator for today's program who is my friend and colleague, Mariana Abrantes. She's on the board of directors of the Sousa Mendes Foundation, and she's joining us today from Portugal. I'll give her the floor in a minute. Right now, I want to mention that you've all seen a movie. You saw the film Sepharad by Luis Ismael. That was a dramatized version of the very important history we are telling today, that of a hero named Barros Basto. And you will hear the true story of that hero uh, today. So not fictionalized, but the actual historical truth. So welcome, sit back, relax. And Mariana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olivia. Hello from Portugal. Bem-vindos a todos. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this uh, SMF event to help rescue another hero from oblivion, Capitan uh, Artur Barros Basto, who you can see in this 1937 picture uh, in his... Um, military, uh, with all his military honors as a war world, World War I hero. Uh, and um, this story takes place in Porto, Portugal's second city, which uh, um, where he was, uh, where he lived. And it takes us into the interior of Portugal about 150 to 200 miles to the Spanish border. Uh, these were some of the trips that uh, Barros Vasso took during his uh, adventures. And um, before we go on into the, uh, into the, uh, before I mention and introduce you to the, the, uh, the speakers, I'd like to just touch on a couple of um, definitions. Um, one is the new Christians. For many of you, that's not a new, not a new definition. These were the, the people who, the Jews who were um, forced to convert to Christianity in uh, 1497, the Anusim. Uh, there were lists of uh, new Christians uh, that were identified until the 1800s in Portugal. And then there were the Marranos who were also Jews who converted, but who um, were forced to convert and continued to practice uh, Judaism in, in secret. Uh, we all hear those words uh, several times. Of course, uh, you all know the Sephardic Jews. I, uh, I will not uh, describe that because I'll probably make a mistake. So um, now we can um, uh, meet our speakers. And uh, to help us understand this fascinating figure, we have uh, journalist uh, Inácio Steinhardt, who was born in Lisbon and uh, lived in Portugal for decades. And he's um, um, speaking to us from Israel. Welcome, Inácio. Inácio is, of course, um, the co-author of a 1997 biography of Captain Barros Basto, Ben Roche, the Apostle of the Moranos, you can see here. It's in Portuguese, so one of these days, you, uh, after some time, you can read it all. Very interesting. And his co-author, historian Elvira Mea, is a retired professor from the University of Porto. She's in this post today and uh, sends her regrets. Uh, we are also fortunate to have uh, two other speakers who will share their very personal side of the story. Uh, Koki van der Berg, uh, Fisher, who's a communications consultant and the great granddaughter of one of the benefactors of the Porto Synagogue. She will share that and her, her family's experience uh, uh, passing through Portugal in 1940. Uh, Koki speaking to us from Miami, Florida. And then um, we will hear Dara Jeffries, an American Portuguese lawyer who lived in and practiced in Portugal for uh, over 15 years and who continues very tied, very um, uh, involved with the Porto Synagogue. 
She will tell us about that uh, community today and the uh, other details of uh, the new life of Jews in Portugal after the law of nationality. She's also speaking to us from uh, Florida. So uh, since um, we are now ready to hear from Inacio, I will ask him to start and uh, to tell us his very, uh, his, um, and to present this very interesting Captain Barros Basto to us. Thank you, Inacio. Please go ahead. Thank you. Shalom from Israel to everybody. <clears throat> In 1987, two American journalists that visit Porto wrote the following. Baruch Vashto is a legend about whom a biography is waiting to be written. 10 years later in 1997, Professor Alvira May and myself wrote the book that you have just seen. Our reward for the extensive research done was not only the book, but the feeling that we had penetrated the soul of a man of flesh and blood, not a legend. The story of Baruch Bashto was one of the most important ep episodes of the Jewish history in the decades of 1920 and 1930. All main encyclopedias, Jews or not, have entries with this name. And a quick search in Google returns more than 30,000 sources and references. The British historian Cecil Roth wrote a short biography of the man he appreciated so much, and he called him Apostle of the Marano. Well, Apostle perhaps, but Varjbasto was not really a Marano. Artur Karl Varjbasto, his full name, <coughs> who was born in 1887 in Amarante, a small town near Porto, in a practicing Catholic but broken family. He was raised in Porto by his mother and in the school vacations he used to spend in Amarante with his grandfather. At the age of nine, the old man revealed to him a terrible family secret. They were descendants of the Israelites from the Bible stories. In the child's mind, those Israelites were the Jews, a people from the past that did not exist anymore. Arthur was a sensitive and mystical child, always interested in the origins of everything. Above all, he abhorred the sinister Catholic processions of black dressed monks to which his mother took him and searched for a more sibling relationship with the creator. As a young adult, he had already read and absorbed the theosophical writings of Madame Blavatsky and Rudolf Steiner. He had found a Muslim, a Muslim friend who introduced him to the readings of the Quran. The secondary studies he made in the army school because his mother could not afford to pay for a private school. However, in 1904, he read in a newspaper that the synagogue had been inaugurated in Lisbon. This came to him as quite a surprise. So the Jews, the Jews that his grandfather mentioned still existed and here in Portugal, he must visit the synagogue. The occasion only occurred when the army sent him to the university study in Lisbon. Then he attended the service in the synagogue one Friday evening. When asked who he was, he didn't know exactly how to answer. So he said that he was a Muslim. Surely enough, that didn't make him much welcome. He continued to attend uh, other days, and one of the officials of the synagogue that appreciated his constant uh, questions and was willing to answer. The ritual and the prayers appealed to the young man, and he asked to be admitted as a member. That was, that was not so easy. 
Orthodox Jews do not accept proselytes. Only a rabbinical court could convert them, and there was none in Portugal. However, the few hundred Jews in Lisbon had come from Morocco. They were only tolerated and feared that any suspicious suspicion of proselytism would engender and danger their status. Baruch Vast was not a man to be stopped by an obstacle. They didn't want him, then he had a solution. Everybody, every religion that he knew was inspired by, by a man, a man like him. Why couldn't he also create a new religion based on his own belief? He then launched the doctrine of Oriam, a Hebrew word for light from the West. He wrote about it in the newspapers, and believe me or not, he got a few hundred proselytes. 1917, First World War, Portugal took part in the war with an expeditionary force, and Barrios Basto was sent to Flanders as the commander of an infantry battalion. Even in the trenches, he went on writing doctrinal books for his faithful Gloria Mites. He also met there a French Jewish captain and spent hours learning from him in the barracks. On his return to Portugal, something unexpected happened. In an event in praise of the Portuguese heroes of, in the, of the war, somebody mentioned that Barros Bato might be a relative of a certain general. This reacted saying that the, there was no Jewish blood in his family. And at the same time, his girlfriend, whom he intended to marry, told him that they had to stop dating because her father would never allow her to marry a Jew. So Jew was a stigma. Let it be, he tried again to convince the Lisbon community. As it didn't work, he traveled to Tangier, from where many of the Jewish, uh, Jews, Portuguese Jews had come and presented him himself to the rabbinical court. After passing all the many exams to which, to which he was submitted, he returned to Lisbon with an official certificate of being a regular Jew. Then he asked the secretary of the community to represent him in asking for the hand of a young lady of one of the best Jewish families in, of Lisbon, whom she, he married. His, his godfather was the future president of the Lisbon congregation. And the army placed him again in Oporto, where he started to search for Jews. He gathered 17 Ashkenazi Jews who had no organized community nor synagogue. Baruch Basto proposed to organize one. It so happened that one of them, a Lithuanian Orthodox failure, had just received the news that his father had died. During one year, he had to say Kaddish in the presence of a quorum of 10 Jews. The captain's proposal was providential for him. Menashe made himself available to help create a synagogue. They rented a private room and started daily services. It is known that the, the, proper, the providence is full of surprises. One day, some unknown Portuguese people attended the services, claiming that they were also Jews. In their villages were women that practiced Jewish rituals in secret. Baruch Bastu saw immediately of what the grand, his grandfather had told me. He had to see this. He went to see those villages. Those crypto Jews crept all their religious activities in complete secret for fear of the Inquisition that had ceased to exist 200 years ago. But the fear was still very strong. Secrecy 
who was then part of their ritual. Violet, violating the secrecy was a sin that obviously in the villages, everybody knew who were the Jews. Since the Republican constitution of 1911, religion was free in Portugal and the Catholic clergy had, had lost much of his power of coercion. Barros Vast would arrive in his army uniform, accompanied by the commander of the near army unit, who introduced him as a Jew, a Jewish colleague. This produced the effect of impressing the former Maranos, who started to raise their heads. But it was not easy to conquer the fear of the women that were the men who were the were the ends of the faith. Barthus Vash started what he called the movement for the rescue of Marano and became a very active missionary. He created small Jewish centers and synagogues in 34 different locations in Portugal. He started an intensive field work in small towns in the north to overcome the fear of the Marano to make public their sacred practices. This was no obstacle for the, for the captain to perform at the same time a publicity campaign with the Jewish communities from all the world. The intention was to mobilize institutional and material support. The propaganda achieved these objectives. Known leaders and public opinion influences came to Porto to personally witness the phenomenon unique in the world. Naturally, each visitor saw the local situation from his personal perspective and a different scope. Many understood that Darus Vatka was the ideal, ideal person to guide these fellow countrymen. Therefore, the most urgent support needed was financial. This was the point of view of the Portuguese Maranos Committee created in London by the Spanish and Portuguese community. They took charge of support activities around the world, betting in full confidence in the capital's judgment, even if here and there it seemed less correct. Barros Basto decided that first and above all, it was mandatory to give to the Maranos the feeling that they kept, uh, <laughs> that the traditions that they kept during the centuries were accepted. Then it was necessary to show them the current abuses of the mainstream Judaism and let them decide if and when to absorb them and integrate with their own. He also thought that it was important to make the Maranos proud of their religion. They needed to have a synagogue on its own building, like the Catholic Church. He used the donation that he received from the Baron of Rothschild to buy the land for his temple. Brick by brick, using all the money he could raise, he started to build the new synagogue until he had to suspend the works for lack of money. But it so happened that the, the Iraqi millionaire from Hong Kong, Sir Eli Kaduri, lost his wife, Laura, that was from Portuguese origin. The London Committee induced him to contribute to the building of the Porto Synagogue in their memory. In 1933, Kaduri went to Porto to see what was done and decided to contribute with the missing 5,000 pounds. One way to activate the mission was to bring to port to the youngsters that had been less exposed to the old secret traditions and after the intensive training, send them back to the villages to teach the others. For this purpose, he created in the synagogue a yeshiva. Other leaders, stricter observance of the Jewish uh, orthodoxy thought that Varush Vashto had the merit of defining 
that now he should step aside and give way to the mainstream, which will designate new master for the swift return of the lost brother. The old rental synagogue will suffice, no need for a cathedral. That was the case of a Dutch industrialist and Orthodox Jew who did business in Portugal. He also met Varj Vashta, which uh, visited some of the communities uh, of Maranos and reported what he has seen and heard to his companions in the Bnei Lodge to which he belonged in the Netherlands. In the first day in Varj Vashta, on their unilateral decision to create a pro committee in the Netherlands. Baruch Bastu feared the duplication and dispersion of resources and suggested that they should coordinate with London, but that didn't work. Baruch Bastu had managed to hire a qualified rabbi from Palestine that had lived in Brazil and spoke Portuguese. However, relations between the two deteriorated when their views in the, uh, in the region's matters came into conflict. Then the Dutch, the Dutch took advantage of the conflict to move their support to one of the communities created by the captain in Braganza, separating him from the central movement in Port. But short, shortly, they shunned, changed their mind and stopped paying the revised wages, leaving him and his family in precarious situation. Braganza returned to the captain's fair in a position of semi-independence. This was not the end of the Barbados to misfortunes. The power and influence of the reactionary clergy began to rise again and to influence the military hierarchy. The captain was assigned to army units located far from Porto and from his Yeshiva. So he was happy when the family of German Sephardic refugees from Hamburg wrote asking for help to escape from Germany. As they were extremely qualified people, Rajbat invited them to come to Portugal. He made the father be elected president of the community in his place. The son was hired as a teacher in the yeshiva. But it was this teacher that betrayed the captain by means of an anonymous letter to the police of Porto, accusing him of, of homosexual practices, which then were a him. The crime. The commander of the port police was very upset. If the Jews have dirty laundry, why don't they wash it at home? But instead, the denunciation resulted in a process started at the Porto military court and closely watched by the political police by order of the minister of war, who was the prime minister himself. When the watchers reported to the minister that apparently there was a risk that the respondent might be acquitted, the minister illegally and by his own hand ordered to send the fire to the army disciplinary board and an all my body to whose decisions there was no appeal. Of the nine accusations, only one was confirmed with a strange wording, behavior unworthy of a Portuguese army officer. The captain was condemned to separation from effective service, meaning losing all his rights, salary, social security, retirement, retirement etc. Meanwhile, in the process at the military court, he was acquitted. By Rushbashtu failed the lawsuits for defamation, which was closed three years later without a trial. Despite being disheartened, the captain was not a man to give up easily. 
during the Holocaust, the community extended all possible support to the refugees that reached Sparta. The capital himself contributed substantially to the rescue of tens of Jews who crossed the Pyrenees undocumented and were brought to a farm in Braganza owned by Artur Mirandella with the active action of this member of the Braganza community and even of the population. Despite all the turmoil, the Mekor Chaim synagogue who was consecrated in January 1938 in the presence of more than 300 leaders, Jewish leaders from all over the world. In 1946, Baruch Vashto made his last mission trip to the interland. He was satisfied for his achievements. However, the Holocaust and the political change in the regime in Portugal left their scar uh, in the Marandos. Once again, they returned to the secrecy of the religion of their ancestors. On the 9th of March 1961, Baruch Bashto died. His was in last will was to be buried in full uniform with all his medals in the plot of the family in the Christian cemetery of Amaranti. Who asked why not in the Jewish cemetery of Lisbon? He answered, they didn't want to meet at the beginning. In spite of the revolution of 25th of April, 1974, that put an end to the dictatorship in Portugal, the army postponed the moral rehabilitation of Baruch which was requested first by his widow, then by his daughter. It was too embarrassing for the Portuguese army. In 2012, finally, his granddaughter made a request to the parliament and it was approved by the majority <laughs> of the parties. Isabel, who has inherited his grandfather's resistance to all obstacles, is still fighting for his reintegration in the army in the rank of coronel, which he would have reached had he not been separated from the service. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. Uh, thank you this, uh, for this uh, in-depth analysis of uh, Barros Bastos, um, uh, for his transformation. So now I, I will uh, take over and um, uh, show, discuss uh, some of the slides that we prepared with some of this information. If um, if you if I may. So um, here's a, this slide shows uh, a Marano woman um, carrying out the Shabbat ceremony with a light inside the wall closet. If a stranger comes in, she would close the door. This is a, a picture of uh, Captain Barros Basto during World War One in his barracks in Flanders. This is the facade of the Kaduri Mekorheim synagogue in Porto, Portugal, the great synagogue in the Iberian Peninsula. And this is um, a picture of a very important ceremony that took place many years later. We see here uh, Inácio Steinhardt um, uh, uh, with glasses uh, speaking. So uh, he was a, a, a very good looking young man. He's still a very good looking man. And uh, we see uh, these um, four other gentlemen who, as you can see, at all, um, <coughs> uh, all have Portuguese names. And uh, beneath the, each of the names is the name of the town that he came from. These were the towns that I showed in the map originally. Braganza, all the way to the side of, um, of uh, all the way to the Spanish border, Argozelo as well, and then Fornos, de Al Fornos and Covilhã, south and east. Uh, so th these were the places, these were these young men, or these men were the young men who came to study at the Yeshiva 
in Porto. And of course, uh, this is the Kaduri Mekom Haim Synagogue on a big, um, on a big day in January 2020. And um, uh, one of our one of our speakers today is here, and I'll let you guess who. Perhaps she will she will tell. Thank you. So. So thank you very much, Inacio. And now we, um, I'm going to uh, pass over to the 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 word pass the words to uh, uh, Koki and then to Dara. Uh, so um, Koki, will you um, take over, please? Thank you, Mariana. Thank you to the Sosa Mendes Foundation and a special thanks to Olivia Matis. My name is Koki Fisher. Samuel van den Berg was my great-grandfather. He was born in 1864 in Os, the Netherlands, as the youngest of seven sons. His parents were hardworking Orthodox Jews who ran a grocery shop and traded in butter. Sam died in 1941 in Nice, one year after my mother escaped from Bayonne, France, with a visa issued by Aristide Souza Mendes. On my first journey with the Souza Mendes Foundation in 2017, we visited the Porto Synagogue. I was so moved to see my great grandfather's name on the wall of the library, together with the other benefactors who had funded the construction of the synagogue in the 1930s. Why am I telling you this? It is important to know that I had no idea how my mother escaped Europe in 1940, nor was I aware of the connection my family had to the Porto Synagogue until Olivia Mattis discovered the plaque in 2016. I would like to share a brief historical background. The Vandenberg family was one of the first entrepreneurs to start a margarine factory in the Netherlands around 1872. Margarine was a new product, cheaper, with a longer shelf life than butter. There was a big market for it. In time, as the youngest son, Sam became the engine behind the huge success of the Vandenberg family margarine enterprise. In 1891, the family moved the factory to the city of Rotterdam, a modern and tolerant port city. With better transportation logistics, Rotterdam also offered better education opportunities for the children. In addition, Rotterdam accepted Jews in the city council, as opposed to the more conservative provincial town of Os. With a keen interest in civic service, Sam became a member of the Rotterdam City Council and later became a member of the Dutch Parliament in The Hague while continuing his full-time executive position at the Margarine Factory. The two older brothers, Jacob and Henry, had settled in England to establish the margarine business there. They became active members of the Anglo-Jewish Association. Eventually, in 1929, the Margarine Uni, a joint venture between the Vandenberg and Jürgen's businesses, merged with Lever Brothers in England to become the multinational Unilever. Here is a picture of Sam and Betsy in 1927 on their 40th anniversary. They look like they're ready to dance the Charleston. Sam was a man with a keen intellect, a very curious mind, and a passion for the history of the Jewish people in the Middle East. He was dedicated to social causes related to Jewish issues and had a strong interest in international affairs. Sam and Betsy traveled extensively, visiting archaeological sites in the Middle East. In 1921, they traveled to Egypt and Palestine together. Growing up in an orthodox and observant home, Sam became secular later in his life. Yet his strong Jewish values, a sense of tikkun olam, and his lifelong fascination with Jewish history never waned. He had a very large library and loved to immerse himself in his books. He spoke and read several languages. Around 1921, he befriended Eliezer ben Yehuda, known as the father of modern Hebrew. A passionate supporter of Ben Yehuda's efforts to revive Hebrew as a modern spoken language, Sam gave Ben Yehuda financial backing for his very important work. After a very successful professional career, 
Some retired from the margarine business at age 65, but stayed active in Jewish causes. In the early 1930s, he became the Dutch representative of the International Jewish Agency and a governor of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, together with Chaim Weizmann, Albert Einstein, Sigmund Freud, and other brilliant minds. There is a letter from Chaim Weizmann calling Sam the key man in the Netherlands for Jewish causes. In March 1930, the Netherlands Maranus Committee was founded in Amsterdam by Leopold Herzberger and Maurits van Son. This committee felt a moral duty to lend the Portuguese Maranus a helping hand in their efforts to return to the Jewish faith. In the same year, Sam joined the board of the Netherlands Maranus Committee. This document, dated 1930, is a photo of an appeal by the Netherlands Maranus Committee for financial help to sponsor a rabbi from abroad to provide spiritual guidance to the Portuguese Maranos. This appeal went to all Jews in the Netherlands, and I quote, we therefore make an urgent appeal to your Jewish sentiment and solidarity to make this request possible. If you look at the names on the right, on the right that will be zoomed, the names of the committee members, there we go. And you might find your own families and ancestors on this list. You will also note that some of the names are both Sephardic and Ashkenazi. As you see above, Samuel Vandenberg was a board member of the committee. At the end of 1930, both the Netherlands and British Maranos Committee sponsored the trip of Rabbi Baruch Ben Yaakov from Saloniki, Greece to Porto with an important financial contribution from Samuel van den Berg. Each time I have visited the Porto Synagogue, I have been overwhelmed by this profound feeling, a personal attachment to Sam's cause and a feeling of strong cultural identification with Portugal. In fact, I plan to move to Portugal in July. Throughout the years, with the Holocaust ever present, yet ever silent, I have been trying to examine, understand, and confront the origins of my own demons, as I am defined by my family history. So this is why I want to emphasize the importance of sharing our stories with the next generations. Here you will see the obituary of Samuel van den Berg in Halapid, the periodical of the Porto Jewish community. The last name was misspelled. I would like to add my thanks to Ignacio Steinhardt, who recently informed us that actually uh, Captain Baruch Bashto had written this obituary. So I would like to read the English translation. At the beginning of February of this year, God called onto his divine present, presence, Mr. Samuel van den Berg, Dutch senator, a friend of the Portuguese Maranus, honor, honorary member of the Jewish community of Porto. He left Holland before the German occupation and went to live in his home in Nice. He was a just man. He was a good man. Peace to his soul. Era um justo, era um bom, paz a sua alma. And now I would like to pass it, this, I have the pleasure of passing this on to Dara Jeffries, who will continue with her presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cookie. Well, I, I think I want to begin by saying that um, Captain Baruch Bashto was perhaps a flawed man in many ways, but he was a visionary. And he was heroic in his idealism and in his um, energy. Um, you know, those roads, for those of you that have seen the movie, he went on horseback. And that's because you had to go on horseback. You know, they didn't have the roads that we have today, thanks to the European Union mostly. And so going to those places was, you know, it was difficult. It was very difficult to go inland. 
And so he had a vision to build this enormous synagogue in Porto, thinking that he would attract all these Maranos and all these people and build a very large community. Um, and that one day it would be full. Um, and he built what was really uh, the biggest and is the biggest uh, synagogue in the Iberian Peninsula. But I think I can say, you know, with a certain amount of confidence that he, his dream was realized because although he ultimately failed in his mission to bring Maranos into the Jewish community, and I saw a question in the chat about that, ultimately there were no Maranos that came to the Jewish community of Porto. So that never actually happened. Ultimately, I mean, they came initially, you know, but there was none of them ever converted and none of them ever stayed. So there was no um, Maranos. There was later, um, there was quite a few that converted in Belmonte, and there were a few that ended up uh, going to Israel and having a conversion, but we, we don't have Maranos uh, today. Um, but I think he would be very happy to see that the seeds that he planted um, have blossomed. And uh, we have, you know, this enormous and beautiful synagogue that some of you have mentioned that you visited. Um, I have to say, Mariana, the picture you showed is what it was an old one. It looks much prettier now. It's had its face washed and it's painted and it has many, uh, many new things. So we'll have to give you an, a, a more updated picture to show. But certainly that one was what it looked like at the time uh, before its facelift. And anyway, I, I think that, as I say, it was, it was an amazing feat that he did to have built a synagogue the way he did. If you think about it, it was the brink of World War II. Uh, it was quite a time to be uh, inaugurating uh, a house for, for Jews. But today the community has over 500 members from 30 countries. And I would say that probably 90% are Sephardic. And at so much so that in fact, the, the, the synagogue actually has two prayer rooms now. So you have a very large prayer room that some of you may have seen um, that is used for the Sephardic ceremony. And then we built a second prayer room uh, for Ashkenazi ceremonies when, uh, for high holidays, mostly for Passover, um, because the rest of the time, the, the, there's only the one, the one service. Um, I'm actually very proud of that. I'm very proud of the fact that our community is so diverse. I think it's that you will agree, all of you that belong to different communities, I'm sure we will agree, it's a very unusual for a Jewish community to bring together um, such a vast spectrum of Judaism from the least observant to the most orthodox you know, whether it's a Sephardic uh, community or Ashkenazi, and they're all under one roof. And I, I think that's something I'm very proud of. Um, the community is thriving in that it also has all the facilities it needs uh, at its disposal. So there are kosher restaurants, there are even hotels. We've made arrangements with hotels that, you know, that can cater to very observant and kosher guests. It has a cemetery, a youth center, um, and two museums, which I believe are, are world-class. And the most recent, which we just inaugurated, um, is the Holocaust Museum, because it's part of our mission to serve the wider community and provide education about Judaism and, and perform cultural outreach. And that's because the Jewish community of Porto sees itself not just as a Jewish community, but as an organization that um, has cultural and interfaith objectives, particularly in the fight against anti-Semitism and to, to fight against entrenched negative stereotypes of Jews that exist everywhere, and in Portugal is no exception. Um, so consequently, the community devised a global project that involved um, a protocol with the Porto Roman Catholic Diocese, and it works on joint charitable initiatives and cooperation. And that actually includes the movie Sephirad that you've seen in other films, because the proceeds of those films in Portugal go to social causes. The premise is that to defeat prejudice, you have to combine aid um, to the needy and education. And that's what we've been trying to do through the films and the museums. And the community offers uh, courses to school teachers to combat anti-Semitism and hosts thousands of students um, and tourists every year. And uh, because we believe that that's the best way to combat anti-Semitism and foster interreligious harmony and understanding. So we have very close uh, friendship and protocols with not only the Catholic Church, but also with the Muslim community of Porto. So why has the community increased so much? Um, certainly when I was growing up, um, the community was very small, but it has grown uh, substantially. And I think that's partly due to the law of nationality that I think uh, Olivia may have mentioned at the beginning, and that was amended in uh, the law of nationality, uh, granting Portuguese nationality was amended in 2013. Um, and really started going into effect in around 2015. 
and it grants a path to Portuguese citizenship for descendants of those Portuguese Jews that were expelled uh, during during the Inquisition, and caused so many, you know, caused so many. The Inquisition caused so many to flee Portugal, and um, I don't think many people know this, but the Inquisition in Portugal was actually only formally abolished in the 19th century, um, in 1821. So it it lasted a very long time. Um, one of the requirements for the law of nationality for to apply for citizenship as a descendant of a, of a Sephardic, Port Portuguese Sephardic Jew is to obtain a certificate from either the Porto Jewish community or the Lisbon Jewish community, which attests to their Sephardic uh, Jewish or origins. And that's an enormous responsibility for the community, uh, you know, providing a service to the Ministry of Justice in Portugal and to Jews who have felt unsafe or persecuted in their home countries um, or who simply wish to reclaim their heritage. And uh, we take that very seriously. Uh, we've uh, developed an entire department and staffed it appropriately um, to, to handle this because it's a, it's a very, very large um, commitment. Uh, but the, I think the other reason the community has grown is because Portugal itself has become a very desirable destination, both as a place to visit and a place to retire, as Cookie will attest to. Um, so she is joined by many that have made that decision. Uh, I think Portugal has a wealth of history and culture, and the Portuguese are incredibly welcoming people, and they're generally very proud of their Jewish heritage. Um, and in fact, as you saw in the film Sefarad, the synagogue acted as a place of refuge for Jews fleeing from the Nazis. Uh, and some of them were granted visas to Portugal from Aristid Sosa Mendes himself. Uh, so, but, but interestingly, they didn't remain in Portugal for the most part and they emigrated. So they used Portugal as a sort of transit uh, point, uh, mostly going to the Americas, both North America and South America. So for decades, the Jewish community of Porto remained very small indeed. And it was often difficult to even get a minion uh, and it comprised mostly those families that had settled in Porto during the, the, the early 20th century. So it was really only more recently that the numbers um, increased. Thank you, Dara. Uh, so uh, I understand we're now, uh, you ha now have what, 500 members? Yes, that's right. Um, uh, 500 members from over 30 countries. So that's quite, oh. a, quite a mix okay. there. All right. Uh, thank you very much. It's been, um, uh, so we can see that this is um, uh, a, a, a vibrant community. It's come around full circle. Yes. And uh, so I'm, um, I'm, uh, I just want to take a minute to, um, to review some of the uh, timeline that we've heard because um, I, I had to do this myself because I, I'm not good with dates. And um, uh, I couldn't remember what went first. So it, uh, I would uh, take this story back to 1478, which was when the Inquisition was introduced in Spain. It was later introduced in Portugal in 1536. So this is a, a 500 year old uh, timeline. Then in 1492, the Jews were expelled from Spain and uh, in 1496 from Portugal. You remember that around this time, Columbus was looking for America yet. Uh, in the the fast forward to the 1920s, Barros Basto was creating the Portuguese, uh, the, the Jewish community in Porto as uh, Nasser described with uh, bringing this group that was still um, very into a formal uh, uh, prayer uh, setting. And then he set out to look for the hidden Jews, for the Marranos, in his uh, work of rescue, his obra de resgate, uh, to, to um, uh, convince the, the hidden Jews who had uh, been living in secret for 500 years that they could, uh, that they could uh, uh, basically show their faith, uh, not just show their faces, but to be, uh, to be known. And then in the 1930s, um, he, he moved on to his next big project and to the Jewish community's big project, which was the creation of the synagogue, as, as uh, Cookie also described. And um, then uh, it was very curious that, uh, meanwhile, some Jews that had arrived in Portugal were 
um, in the community, and there was, uh, as as uh, you as Inácio described, some tension within the community. So um, he was unjustly accused, and it was uh, and um, ended up being discharged from the military for conduct unbecoming. So he died in disgrace in '61. So you and in poverty. Um, the the Carnation Revolution, the the in 1974, put an end to the Salazar regime, and brought democracy to Portugal. And then, only uh, in 2012, after the efforts of the families and uh, of other, uh, was uh, Barros Vasto officially reinstated. And then, of course, the law of nationality, which I had, which uh, um, that I just described, was in 2015. So we we see the the circle coming around, and we we hope now that the circle just goes up, and uh, it continues. So I will pass this back to Olivia. So yes, and I'm going to briefly tell you about some upcoming programs. Then I will send it back to Mariana, who might be able to take some audience questions. We'll see how we're doing on time. I think there is time, and then to final thoughts. So our next three programs are quite fascinating. I hope you will sign up for all three. Our next two programs feature women, women heroes. One is uh, Faye Shulman. We're featuring her next week for Mother's Day. She just died at age 102. She was a Polish partisan and she was also a photographer. The only photographs that survive of the Polish partisans in World War II were taken by Faye Schulman. She was also an author. She wrote her memoir, which we are offering for sale. And one of our speakers, Joanne Gilbert, features uh, Faye Schulman uh, in a chapter in her book on women of valor rescuers, women rescuers in, um, and resistance fighters in Poland. So Joanne Gilbert, uh, is also offering books, uh, signed and inscribed books uh, for sale. So I, I hope you'll take advantage of that and that you'll, you'll sign up. Uh, the week following, we're featuring the story of Noor Inayat Khan. She was a Sufi Muslim. Her father was from India. Her mother was American. She grew up in Paris and London. She ended up being a spy for the British. She came into France and she was a radio operator, very much like Hannah Senesch. It's a, kind of a similar story to that of Hannah Senesch. She was captured and murdered at Dachau. Her last word was liberté. There's a book about her called Spy Princess. And we have the author of that book, Shrabani Basu. And Shrabani Basu is also offering signed and inscribed copies of her book, which is a bestseller and a historical thriller in conjunction with this program. So definitely you'll want to take advantage of that as well. The books also make great gifts. The following week, we are featuring the story of the composer Felix Mendelssohn, who was born as a Jew, the grandson of the great philosopher Moses Mendelssohn, but he was baptized Lutheran by, as, as a child by his parents, uh, because in those days it was, it was difficult in Germany to to have full civil rights as a Jew. So um, he, he grew up uh, as a Lutheran, but also remembering his Jewish roots and his music reflects that. Um, but then during the Nazi period, his music was banned and his descendants, many of whom were Lutheran, were retroactively converted back to Judaism by the Nazis and persecuted as Jews. One of these descendants is the filmmaker, Sheila Heyman, who is British because her father ended up as a German refugee boy, German Jewish refugee boy in England. So Sheila was born in England. She made this film on Mendelssohn, on the music, on her family. It's a remarkable story. So you won't want to miss that either. You'll have information about all of the above uh, in the email you'll get after today's program, as well as how to donate because we do rely on uh, donations, your donation is tax deductible. We, we do have most of our programs as free programs, so the donations certainly go a long way. Uh, Mariana, I will now toss the floor back to you. Thank you, Olivia. And uh, now 
I think we have, we were really are running out of time uh, for uh, many questions. I, there was, um, um, uh, there was a, a question about, uh, do we know um, who made the accusation? Um, and then there were a number of uh, questions about um, uh, how to see the film and uh, the, um, and how did the Salazar regime treat the Jews? I think those three. I, I will take the last one about Salazar, but perhaps um, uh, Dara can say how we can see the film. And maybe Anasu can just say a little bit uh, about the, the accusation uh, uh, that we, uh, or I can, uh, they, we do know uh, regarding the accusation, apparently the, uh, the, the police files have the name of the accuser. Uh, it was somebody from the community, but uh, I don't think, uh, I don't know if that's, um, there's a lot more than that. But um, Dara, why don't you tell us about how to uh, see the, the film Safaran? So I think it's available on several platforms, depending on your country, uh, but you should be able to get it on Amazon Prime, iTunes, Apple iTunes, and I think also Vimeo. And I think that's it. I think, I think those are the three platforms that you could, you could get it on. Okay, thank you. And uh, so uh, perhaps uh, just in uh, closing remarks, uh, Inacio, if you want to talk uh, briefly about the, the accusation and your final thoughts on, um, on the Captain Barrows Basto. Yes, sure, thank you. <clears throat> uh, first of all, about your accusation, uh, the, the answer is yes, it is known who sent the, the anonymous letter. It was an anonymous, so the police doesn't have it, but it's, it is known. The accuser himself confessed before he died that he, he, he had to do that, but I, with your permission, I don't think this is the place to, 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 to give uh, uh, names and uh, the person doesn't live anymore. I knew him very well, very well. I know the family, we are even friends, but uh, I prefer not to, uh, to speak about that. Um, what's uh, the next question? Oh, can, uh, yes, if I have something to say about Barbara's master, two things. First, when the, I started the introduction, I mentioned an article by Ellen and Robert Rosenthal, but I gave only the first half. I said, he said, Baruch Basht is a legend about whom a biography is waiting to be written. The second part is, but the life of devote, a devout Jew with a cause that failed is hardly the stuff of a bestseller. Okay, our book is not a bestseller. For, for, for 14 years after it was published, it's still selling. But uh, it's uh, for sure, Baruch Bart's cause did not fail. And uh, you can see you see the, the, the synagogue that he left. Certainly, it was not, uh, it was used very little about white Baranos. There are no Baranos today. Uh, there is a synagogue in Belmonte. Well, the half of the population were Maranos, and today they are mainstream Jews. They exist. But I have a suggestion to make uh, to the, the board of the, the, the community of Port today. I think that the, the, the only memory of Baruch Basht with the synagogue is that picture in the entry hall, uh, the picture that we have seen here, and that was a, a present of his people when he accomplished uh, 50 years. I, my suggestion is, I dare suggest it, it that the present world create an early, an yearly Memorial Day for Baruch Vashtar. On the day of his death, a ceremony will be made at the synagogue. 
there was one in the 80s that LVIV and I organized, but it should be every year. And perhaps in the same ceremony, the name of uh, Eli Kaduri should also be uh, remembered. Thank you very much. I wanted to, um, to close just uh, to bring us back also to our own uh, hero. Um, I see um, you notice that Artur Barros Basto and Aristides de Sousa Mendes were contemporaries. They were born within a couple of years of each other and they about a hundred miles apart. So they, they were in different um, parts of society. They seem to be, uh, to both have been nonconformist, moving against the tide. They were crushed uh, by the Salazar regime, both of them, but ultimately both were vindicated by history. And the reinstatement and recognition of both Barros Vasto and Sosa Mendes were very important to her, for their families, of course. But uh, as a Portuguese, I think they, these two, uh, reinstatements and recognitions were even more important for Portugal because it enables us, um, the Portuguese, to rescue and to, to uh, restore and to value uh, forgotten chapters of Portugal's thousand year long history. We're very pleased to share this history with you all for now online, but soon we hope uh, in person on one of the SMF journeys on the road to freedom. So please get your passports and your vaccination certificates ready and then um, come visit next year in Portugal, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you to Inacio, Coca, Dado, Olivia, and Matt for um, uh, uh, bringing us this uh, important story. Thank you to our audience and Mariana for moderating and to our speakers and have a nice rest of your day, everybody. See you next week.